Awesome. It's great to see uh, so many faces uh, become members in this last season, and so uh, some familiar faces who have been around the church a while and just took them a little time to decide to become members, and other people who uh, knew in this last season. So whether you're in one of those two categories, maybe the, maybe the Lord's moving you in that direction. So, okay, Bible time. So if you got a Bible, I hope you do. If not, there's one in the seat in front of you, or it's probably a device somewhere within reach that you can open up a Bible app on. Uh, we're going to be in Galatians 4 this morning. Galatians 4, and in just a moment, we'll read a passage out of Galatians 4 out loud and together, and that'll be on the screens, and uh, so you can follow along there. You know, as we prepare to read the scripture. Uh, over these last several weeks, we've walked through a series that we simply titled Signs of the Times. And we looked at what the Bible teaches, what the Bible tells us about the days that we're living in. We looked at what the Bible teaches us about what it refers to as the last days. And we compared the days that we're living in and we see how are these two things consistent with each other. And indeed, we come to the conclusion that we are living in the last days. Uh, and, and with no degree of certainty can we predict the last day, but with great certainty and with biblical proof, we can say we are living in the last days. And we looked with specific attention, how does the Bible call us to live in such days? It's not enough to know that we're living in the last days. It's, it's what we desire to, how do we live? How do we make the most of opportunities in these days? How do we honor the Lord, walk with him faithfully, do what he's called us to do, run from what he has called us to run from in these last days? I was particularly glad over the, the past two Sundays well, for a couple of reasons. Number one, because my family and I were on vacation, which was awesome, but we paid very close attention to the sermons over the last two Sundays where Pastor Joe, Pastor Joe Featon, for those of you who are new to the church in this last season, uh, is the pastor who p pastored this church for 35 years uh, prior to myself. He's my father-in-law, but he's been a mentor and a great voice of wisdom for not only me and my family and you and your family, but this community, the community of believers here. But for him to preach those last two messages uh, around the signs of the time on the sign of Israel and the sign of lawlessness in these last days, uh, those are particularly helpful. And so we've been spending a lot of time looking at the idea of the last times. Uh, so now, as we officially start this Sunday uh, as the first of the four Sundays of the Advent season, did you, if you haven't caught that yet, Christmas is coming. We are now officially in the season of Advent. Uh, we're really wanting to take an um, opportunity to point our hearts, our thoughts, our minds, our families, our schedules towards the consideration of the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnation of God with us. Sometimes we refer to Jesus' birth 2,000 years ago as the first coming of our Savior, and we look at the end of times, the final day, as his second coming. And so as we prepare for Advent, I'd like to take a couple of weeks here and look at what the Scripture speaks about the time the time around the birth of Christ. And there is a phrase that's repeated many times throughout the scripture, in particular as it relates to the, the birth, the advent, or the incarnation, the first coming of Jesus. And he uses this phrase, in the fullness of time, in the completeness of time. In some places it says, at just the right time. And so as we, with our minds and spirits fresh on an awareness and consideration of the last times, we also look at the period and the way in which God saw time at the birth of Jesus as the fullness of time. And we, we're going to take a few weeks, breathe deeply, and really consider time more from God's perspective. And really consider the times that we're living in in light of this vision uh, that God gives us about ourselves, about the world, and about his sovereignty over it. And so as we think of time, 
uh, you know, we, sometimes we panic. Sometimes we look at all the things we have to do before a certain deadline, and we ask ourselves the question, do I have enough time to get it done? How many of you remember April 15th, and you remember asking yourself that question? That's tax day, for those of you who hadn't had the joy and privilege of filing your federal income tax yet. Uh, that day's coming, so, uh, you know, or, or we look at Christmas, and some people, Christmas is a wonderful time of traditions and family and gathering, and yet, for others, it's a time of impossible deadlines, of trying to find the perfect gift with the right budget in the right amount of time, and, get, and, just, and then you find it online. I've been getting, I know Christmas is coming, you know how I know? Because the frequency of text messages from my kids has been increasing with links to things that they think would be great for me to add to the, their Christmas lists. You know, you go, hey, this is what I want. Here's a link to buy it. And by the way, it's on sale for the next 25 minutes. Act now. You know, you just think, time. No matter who you are, no matter how old you are, how young you are, no matter how experienced you are, or how novice you are, no matter how rich you are, or how poor you are, no matter how healthy you are, or how struggling in your physical health you are, we all have the same amount of time in every day. We all have the same 24 hours given to us daily to live. And so as we consider the time that we see as like a fuse running out with so many events moving towards us, even all of time and the end of it seeming to move more rapidly towards us, as maybe we even consider uh, looking backwards to the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ and the time that was there, I want us to take a step back to not allow the pressures of life to inform our views of time, but to allow the scriptures themselves. To let God's word, which proceeds from God's voice, to inform the view of the time that we're living in now and of all time in general. So having said that, would you stand with me and join me in reading out loud and together Galatians chapter four. We're gonna read verses four through seven. And as we do so, I just, I just want to lay on you this knowledge. You, among all people, have been given a distinct privilege this morning. The privilege is many-fold, manifold, and, and it starts like this. That you've been privileged to gather together freely with other followers of Jesus Christ to speak the words of God, to hear the word of God, to worship freely of our own accord to gather. What a great privilege today is. Has that dawned on you over these last hour together? Oh, wow. In addition to that, you and I have the great and distinct privilege of reading aloud the words of God, listening to others around us speak those words and give life to them. And so God's word is a joy and privilege for us. The people of God is a joy and privilege for us. And during our time of, of, of praising and worshiping the Lord, his presence is a distinct privilege for us. And what he has called us to do and how to live in accord with his mission, what a great privilege. And we are blessed among all of God's creatures. We are blessed, amen? So knowing that blessing, would you read with faith and joy reading aloud God's word. Let's read out loud and together. The words are on the screen and you can follow along. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law, so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Heavenly Father, we are people who want to be aware of the great privileges and joys that you have given us. 
We receive with joy today your word. We receive with joy today your presence among your people, the mission that you have set us about. God, we pray that as we read about our true identity, as we read about your purpose among us, that not only would our minds and our hearts be open to hear that message, but God, it would be like planting a seed in our hearts, in our lives, that begins almost immediately to bear great fruit. God, may your word bear rich fruit in our lives in this season ahead as we consider your view of time. We love you and we pray this in the name of Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to just take an opportunity and walk through uh, some of these verses that we have read together and hopefully opening our hearts and minds to a bigger reality of a season that we're living in than just shopping lists and menus and guest lists and decorations. Christmas is beautiful and I love it. You love Christmas? You got a tree up yet? Okay, we're gonna divide the room here right now. How many of you have a fake tree up? Let me see your hands. Raise it proudly. There's no needles on your floor. There's no mess of smelling of pine in the air unless it's being diffused healthily through a diffuser in the corner of your room. Hypoallergenic friends in the room today. God bless you. All right. How many of you have a real tree? A real tree up in your house and it smells good and there might be critters running around. You don't know, but you got a real tree. Okay, so there we go. There's like, they're on both sides of things. It's fun. It's fun. And so, yeah, Christmas is great. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we will let Christmas in the modern sense tell us what Christmas is about. We'll let Christmas... Uh, dictate our rhythms and traditions and beliefs and everything rather than looking deeper into the bigger picture of it and seeing that God indeed was up to wonderful things 2,000 years ago at the birth of our Messiah and that God is still up to wonderful things because of the birth of our Messiah. Are you with me on that? Okay, so Galatians 4, by the way, Often I will give an assignment during a sermon. Here's my assignment. Read this whole chapter. Read it sometime today. Before you fall asleep uh, eating turkey leftovers, sometime today, read Galatians 4, and you will see there is a beautiful working analogy in here. In fact, many analogies that are culminating, some of which we'll address here today. But Galatians 4 tells us about the birth of Jesus. In fact, just in one verse, the, almost what we need to know about the nativity, what we need to know about the, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago is told to us. It says this, but when the right time came, God sent his son born of a woman subject to the law. You realize from this one verse, we can understand the law and the prophets. We understand that God inserted his son to preach the good news of the kingdom of God among us at the exact right moment in time and from that moment in time led to the events of Jesus' death on the cross, that Jesus was born at the right time and he was born of a woman. The scripture tells us he was not born of the union of a man and a woman as all of us were born, but Jesus was born of a woman conceived by God's Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin. The birth of Jesus was miraculous. Jesus wasn't begotten of any earthly father. He was begotten, born, birthed of the heavenly father. Fully God. And because he was born of a woman, he was also fully human. And so we see that the, the nativity, the, the birth of Jesus is the story of the gospel arriving on the scene. It says that he became subject to the law. That in Jesus' birth, there was a great display of humility and of empathy. Why is it important that Jesus was born subject to the law? Well, for many reasons, and we'll read a few of them in a moment. But Jesus humbled himself to the very limitations that every human being knows. That every human being is used as excuses for why we are such dirtbags at times. And Jesus came subjected to the law to fulfill it 
and to point us to something greater. But I want to key in on this thought here for a few moments of when Jesus was born. Have you ever stopped to consider the world into which Jesus was born 2,000 years ago? In particular, a small sliver which geographically seems very insignificant in the world. Today we call it Israel. Some call it Palestine. In this day it was known as Judea. And Jerusalem and its surrounding environs, Bethlehem, a small village, uh, slightly a, a day's walk from Jerusalem is the place where Jesus was born. You know, we might think of it and we sing songs like, Oh, holy night. Oh, come let us adore him. And when we think of that first Christmas, what a beautiful, tranquil, peaceful world Jesus descended out of heaven into. Even so much that the animals came and they ah, moo and kings and wise men came. And we look, wow, what a peaceful fairy tale kind of moment that was. I hate to burst your nativity bubble. But the world into which Jesus was born, this place, the slice of earth onto which Jesus was placed as fully man and yet also fully God, was one which was embroiled in the highest levels of political corruption. You see, Jesus' people, the people of Israel, were ruled over by a king who bought his kingship by intrigue, by deception, by marrying into the right family, by paying off the right people. Yes, I'm talking about King Herod. King Herod was a ruthless, murderous, lying deceiver who, who ruled over the people of Israel, of Judea, with treachery. It was not a safe world that Jesus the vulnerable child was born into. It was a dangerous world. It was a corrupt world. It was a, a world in which many would not have said this was the perfect timing for God to send his son. In fact, there would have been many, even among God's people, who would have looked at the circumstances, the timing around it, and said time ran out a long time ago. This, this world is hopeless. This world is so corrupt, so far from being a place of hope, so far from being the place that God would smile down upon. This, this place, Judea, 2,000 years ago, was a cesspool of corruption and idolatry and spiritual pride that had led to blindness in so many. In fact, many, even of God's faithful people, grew to places of despair because of the circumstances of their day. They said, this isn't the right time. The right time would have been a long time ago. And yet some, out of that despair, came to the conclusion that maybe God doesn't care about time. Maybe God doesn't care about time. And maybe there is no Messiah coming. Maybe there is no rescue on the way. Maybe there's no hope. And so get all you can and can all you get. Preppers, first century edition. And yet the Bible tells us something entirely different about the period of time. Doesn't tell us that it was any less corrupt. Doesn't tell us that it was any less wicked or sinful or spiritually blind. Doesn't tell us that, that it was, was any nicer or rosier or safer of a place. But it tells us that from heaven's perspective, from God Almighty's vantage point, it was the fullness of time. The perfect moment, there was not one second short in the run-up to that time, and there was not one second extra. You see, God didn't scratch his head wondering if there was enough time to save humanity. God didn't look down and see the wickedness of all things and say, well, I better hurry up. I better get myself into gear. I've been wasting too much time with Thanksgiving, eating turkey, and Christmas is almost here. I better hurry up and get my son ready to get down there. No, no, God didn't struggle with a deadline. God didn't wait and think that maybe I had missed it. Maybe the timing wasn't right. The Bible tells us it was the fullness of time. You know, for many reasons, this statement can be understood as true. For if we look at the conditions politically, geographically, if we look at the conditions economically, even in terms of infrastructure, transportation, roads, language, culture, the time into which Jesus was born by even 
uh, superficial standards was a time that was ready and ripe for the message of the kingdom of God among us. It was a time where most of the world lived under what was the peace of the Roman Empire. Now we say peace, the, the Pax Romana, or the peace of Rome, and we understand that that peace wasn't like the peace that Jesus, the Messiah, brings at the end of time. It was more like uh, a sword poised over somebody's throat saying, you better behave. And so people behaved, and there was relative peace. But because of that peace, there was also an increase of trade between cultures, between nations. And because of a centralized authority in that, the Roman Empire, there was uh, roads and transportations and infrastructure and language and agreed upon norms by which all of this commerce and trade and the movement of people from one place to the other could happen freely and safely. And, in, and, and that might sound a lot like, well, that's no big deal. That's kind of a lot like our world today. It was unprecedented in all of human history to that moment. And into that moment where a message was ready to be moved to the four corners of the earth, starting in Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth, was what was brought about by the birth of Jesus the Messiah. It was the right time. The right time for the message of the kingdom of heaven, the right time for the message of salvation, the right time for hope. No wonder Christianity, no wonder the message of Jesus Christ and the good news of the kingdom made its way around the world within a generation and continues to spread along some of those very same pathways, some of those very same places that it did in that first century. The time was right and ready. It was the fullness of time. You know, we can look at it with the working analogies of Galatians 4 that you might read later today and understand that not only politically and geographically and economically and infrastructure-wise, language, was it the right time, but even spiritually speaking, it was the right time. Spiritually speaking, when we look at the interaction of God Almighty and dealing with human beings, God chose Abraham of all the families on earth to, to call him his chosen and through him bring blessing not only to his own family but to all families. And through the children in the line of Abraham, God delivered the law through Moses, his prophet, to teach and show people the sin and error that rules all of our lives. The law was given as a schoolmaster. And in the fullness of time, the school bell rang and a new message that did not obliterate the law but brought fulfillment to it, Jesus Christ stepped when the spiritual hearts of the people of God were ready to step beyond the schoolmaster of the law, showing them how sinful they were to accept the grace of a Savior who paid the penalty for sin. You see, into this spiritual fullness of time, Jesus stepped. Time was right prophetically. Time was full prophetically. You know, so many of the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah, the prophet Daniel, spoke of the birth of Jesus. In fact, the time of Daniel's prophecy about the birth of Jesus was literally coming to its culmination. For Daniel had prophesied 483 years until the birth of the coming one, the Messiah. And that time was now upon the world, 2,000 years ago, the birth of Jesus. So prophetically, spiritually, uh, in terms of the natural world that we live in, time was full. You see, God looked at time a little different than the people who were leading, than the people who were struggling, than everyone else of the day. We make judgments and discernments. We ascertain specific details about our lives, and we say God's either late or we're not ready for God yet. But I can just tell you this much right now. God never struggles with time. God never shows up at the wrong time. God never shows up early as we often wish he would. But if he did, he wouldn't be God. We would. And by the way, look around the room right now. I don't see any God right here. I see people who belong to God, who are children of God, 
which gives us this idea. You know, John chapter 1, 16, you know, it says, says this, from his abundance, or literally from his fullness. It's the same word that Galatians uses when it speaks of the fullness of time and the abundance of time. Out of the abundance of who Jesus is, we have all received one blessing after another. One blessing. It says here, we have all received one gracious blessing after another, or grace upon grace upon grace. As we, before we read our scripture together, I mentioned how blessed we are as people today to be in God's house, to be together, to be praising the Lord freely, to be pointing our hearts and minds into the scripture and learn from it, to let the word of God dwell richly in us. But I mean, even if you look at some of the lesser or lighter blessings of our day, I mean, think about how much more blessed we are, even in the material way, than our forebears. I mean, you hear the stories maybe over the holidays that you get together and grandparents tell you stories of how tough things were in the old days, you know, where they didn't have socks and so they just wrapped, well, they didn't have toilet paper, so they wrapped paper around their feet or this or that or, you know, just different things. Like, oh man, it was so cold, you could see your breath inside or this or that. You think, I can't remember the last time I saw my breath inside. I can't remember the last time I put anything other than socks on my feet, except for all the last two weeks when we were in a warm place and all I wore was flip-flops. So you're welcome. I do have socks on today, so even though I was not accustomed to it for two weeks. But the thing is, we are so blessed, more blessed in a material or physical sense because of the society that we live in than those who came before us. And yet these blessings mean nothing because these blessings will disappear. But they are given to us nonetheless. They are given to us not to make our lives comfortable, but to point our lives in a place where we can praise God for them, where we can utilize these blessings to bring glory to God by sharing them and blessing others with them. But to these material blessings, to these earthly and temporary and soon to disappear blessings, God, in the fullness of who Jesus is, has given us grace. He has given us forgiveness and salvation and healing and eternal life. He has given us family in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense as well. God has piled blessing upon blessing upon blessing. We are like a, a peanut buster parfait of blessing here today from the heavenly realms. So you're like, what's a peanut buster parfait? Stop by Dairy Queen sometime this week and tell them I sent you. And uh, just kidding. That's, I think that, that's the only thing I ever get at Dairy Queen is a peanut butter parfait. And for those of you who don't know, it's a layer of fudge, a layer of peanuts, a layer of ice cream, another layer of fudge, another layer of peanuts, another la You get the idea, right? It's blessing on blessing on blessing on calorie on calorie on pound on pound on prancer on dancer on... Oh, wait, now how's it go? But in the same way that time was full to receive the Messiah, why, why is it that we have received one blessing after another? Because not only was time full, but Jesus himself is fulfillment of all that God has. He is the fulfillment of God's plan. Ecclesiastes 3 puts the perspective of time like this. It says, yet God made everything beautiful in its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart, but even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. So the, although God has placed his view of time within us, our mortal bodies, our mortal eyes and minds are prevented, without faith, prevented from seeing the beginning from the end, from seeing what God is truly doing. It is only by being transformed through God's word, by the spirit of God within us, that we begin to see God moving in the fullness of who he is and in time. Let's add a couple layers of blessing to who we are today. As we move through, I wanted to tell you this. Verse five of Galatians four, let's go back to Galatians four. It says this, that God sent him, not only when time was perfect, when everything was set up, when everything was right, he sent him with a purpose. Here's what it was, to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law. You say, who is this speaking to? Is this only speaking to Jewish people? 
Is it only Jews who are slaves to the reality of the law? No, it is every human being who is alive is a slave to the reality of the sinfulness of our lives and of the, our inability to please God, to live up to his glory. And so God sent his son Jesus on a rescue mission. And if you picture with me as the working analogy of Galatians 4 up to this point is, that there is a slave market full of people, those who are enslaved, enslaved, not at the will of somebody else, but because of their own sinfulness, they are slaves in cages. And God sends his son to that market with enough money to buy all that belonged to him, and he buys their freedom gives them their freedom, unlocking the doors of the cages that have held them through the generations of their family. And he says, you are now free. This is why God sent his son in the fullness of time, to open doors of imprisonment and of enslavement so that all who believe in this son of God would be made free. He says, so that they would be free. They would be free from their slavery to the law, which leads to death, but more than just freedom. Think of this, just think of Jesus walking down, says, these are mine, this whole row is mine. Un unlock the doors, here's the price for them. All these dirty slaves who have been in cells, rotting away their entire lives, can't smell good, probably don't look too good, probably aren't as educated as they should be, probably can't speak eloquently, but I'll take them all. I'll take them all. And not only did he set them free and say, you're no longer slaves, you are free men and women. He says, furthermore, God purposed and gave the mission to Jesus, not only to free them, but to make them children of God. When was the last time you helped somebody in a very unfortunate circumstance? Maybe it was somebody who you could tell was in a desperate need, and so you gave them a meal, you gave them some money, you gave them a ride, you helped them with a task that they were unable to, 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 to do themselves. When was the last time you helped somebody who was truly down and out? And I pray that in, at some point in the most recent past you've been able to help somebody in that way, but how many times during helping somebody in such a way did you ever have the conclusion, you know, maybe we should just make them a part of the family? I know they just got a cardboard sign saying they need a meal, but why don't we just bring them into the family? You know, it wouldn't be advisable in many circumstances. You say, what? But that's exactly what God did for every single one of us. He purchased us from our place of slavery, and he set us free. And once he set us free, he said, I don't just want you to be free, I want you to be close to me. And I don't simply want you as friends, I want you as my children into my family. This is what Jesus has done for us. We are his very own children. The Bible says he could adopt us as his very own children. Now, just a word of interesting delineation between all of the children of God. Scripture tells us, in fact, in Acts 17, Paul refers to, um, we are all of God's offspring. All of every human being, in a general sense, is a child of God is created in the image of God, is worthy of dignity and respect and protection, especially the most vulnerable, the unborn, the elderly, the sick, the disabled, all of these, the healthy and all, are born in the image of God, created in the image of God. We are all his offspring, as the Bible teaches. And yet, that's a general sense, but in a specific sense, not every human being lives or operates or is identified as a child of God. Even Jesus himself, when speaking to and about those who have rejected the offer of salvation, speaks to those who reject Jesus as children, not of God, but children of Satan. Because there is a, an enslavement. And anyone who is not a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ lives in the reality of being a child of deception and of the deceiver, of Satan himself. These are the problems of the world in which we live. So we have been given a unique standing, not for the sake of being privileged above all else, but for the sake of helping to lead a rescue mission to open up the eyes to those who were our offspring of God and yet aren't living as such. But, so, so we become children of God by faith in Jesus, amen? 
Is that you? I pray it is. I hope it is. And if not, I pray that God moves in your heart today to be able to accept the message of Jesus and become a child of God. This is a wonderful day for that opportunity. On the other side of looking at things, uh, we are given this position of children of God via the miracle and the blessing of adoption. When we put our faith in Jesus, God brings us into the family and gives us that standing. Jesus is different in that Jesus was not adopted to the family of God. Jesus is referred to in the scripture as the only begotten of the Father. Jesus alone was born into this place of salvation. You, I, others, we are born as slaves to the law, to sin. And through faith, we are adopted into the family and given the same standing as a natural born son. But this is what makes us different. And so many false religions teach and believe that because we're Christians, that we're exactly like Jesus and we will become even greater than him. This is not the gospel. Jesus alone was born into this right standing with God because he is God, by the way. We're gonna get to a scripture in a moment that shows us Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit working together in unity in our lives. But I want you to know as Jesus was born that way, you and I were made that way by faith in Jesus. That's what's differing between children of God like us and Jesus, the only begotten. That's what the scripture means, the only begotten. He was the only one born as a son of God, as a son of God. And yet because of our adoption, we have an even greater privilege than, let's say, Adam and Eve had. You say, wow, what a great, you know what? They, they were born in sin. And they never got to place their faith in Jesus Christ. They li lived and paid in their bodies the penalty of their sins. And yet, because of the, of the faith that we have in Jesus, we have been given perfect standing. Here's what it looks like. Verse 6. And because we're his children, can you just say, I'm, I'm one of God's children. If you have faith in Jesus, just say that. I'm one of God's children. Good. You sound good. Way to go. Uh, because we're his children... Uh, God has sent the spirit of his son, the spirit of Christ, into our hearts. Think about the, the parfait of blessings that we've received. Even in these short verses here, we have been purchased from slavery and been given freedom. From our freedom, not only have we been made free, but we have been made children of God. And from that place of being children of God, not born that way, but made that way through God's will, children of God, now we've been given the Spirit of God. The very Spirit of God that hovered over the darkness of the earth and caused, as the Word of God went forth, the earth to exist, the, the mountains to grow, every living creature to find its place, the Spirit Spirit that gave life is now, listen, inside of every one of God's kids. How many blessings do we have that we could count today? It's innumerable, but even as we attempt, we are blown away. Freedom, sonship, the Spirit of God in us. What is going on? I thought this was a Christmas message. It is, but rather Christmas as it should be understood in the fullness of time, in the fullness of God's blessing after blessing after blessing. God's view of time is not that it's running out and he better hurry and do something. God's view of time is that if his people will follow the freedom they've been given, understand the identity that they have been bestowed with as children of God, that they would recognize the fact that they are now bearers of the very powerful Spirit of God Almighty, everything would change for us. We wouldn't look at ourselves or our challenges or our world or our bodies or our families or anything the same when we understand who we truly are. You see, Christmas is as much about identity as it is about anything else. Who are you? Who are you? Are you a child of God? Then you are free. Are you a child of God? Then you bear the Spirit of God Almighty. 
Are you a child of God? Let's add one more. Because his spirit is within us, it causes us to cry out, to cry out, to call out, Abba, Father. This is an interesting phrase, Abba, Father. And I know if you've been a part of church for very long or you grew up in church, you've heard it and you think, oh yeah, I've, I've heard that before, I know what it means. It's like, it means daddy or it means this or that. It, yes, you're correct in saying that, but if I told you that this phrase, Abba Father, and even the word Abba is only used three times in scripture, three times in scripture. Twice, it is in letters like we're reading right now, as the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, penned the Holy Scriptures to be given to believers. And in both cases, in here in Galatians 4 and in Romans 8, where we are told that through the Holy Spirit, we can call out to God Almighty as our Abba Father. What a great picture that is. What a great picture that is. An Abba is a, an Aramaic phrase, which literally is, it, it means yes, like daddy or papa, it would be a term within the household context that a child in the closest moments would speak to their father. You know, sometimes we call our dads dad or father or my kids, if they really want to bother me, they call me by my first name and I just say, knock it off. <laughs> That's not my name, not to you. Anyway, whatever. It just sounds so weird if your kids, if, or if you're a kid and you ever call your parent by their first name, it's usually they say that when I'm like talking to somebody else or not paying attention. They're like, hey dad, hey dad, hey dad. And every dad has this filter. It's like Bose noise canceling headphones, but it's like dad noise canceling ears. And you can understand the difference between a hey dad, hey dad, hey dad, and an Abba father. Hey dad, hey dad. It's like, but when it's serious, when something is in, in great need, picture a child waking in the middle of the night from a terrible dream, feeling vulnerable, feeling frightened, feeling alone, feeling unsafe, remembering that their parent is in the next room. And what would they call out? Would they say, Father? Would they say, um, uh, let's see, that, that guy who lent me half of my genetics? Would they call out your first name or would they say something like, Papa? Daddy! Yeah, something a little less formal, something a little more from the gut and not from the sense of decorum. This is the phrase that the Spirit of God prompts us to call out to Him in our hour of need. In fact, the third time in Scripture, which is actually the first, but the third that we'll, we'll illustrate today comes out of Mark chapter 14. In fact, it is the place where both of these instances of Paul's letters get their understanding from. It is the prayer of Jesus as he was in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night he was betrayed. After the beautiful Lord's Supper that he shared with his disciples, showing them the closeness that they now had with the Father and with one another showing them all of the miracles and teaching and speaking plainly to them, he goes to the garden to pray. And Jesus, fully God and fully man, knowing what was now in front of him, the cross, the suffering, the betrayal, the torture, God laying the heavy burden of the sin of all humanity upon him, knowing that that was just hours away, Jesus was overwhelmed. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 35, it says he went a little further and fell to the ground. He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. And I know we're not preaching on Mark chapter 14, but have you ever felt that way? I can't say as though I've felt that specific burden or that heavy of a burden because Jesus was carrying the sins or anticipating the, carrying the sins of all humanity. What a horrible burden, but I think I've been at the place, as I know you have, of feeling no strength in my knees, and the only thing to do is to fall to the ground and call upon God, knowing what challenges await, knowing what suffering is in the future, knowing what difficulty and what challenging choices must be made, calling out to God, if there's any other way, please. You ever prayed a prayer like that? 
God, I think I know what's coming, but if there's any other way, please. Jesus prayed that prayer. When you feel tempted to just think of Jesus as some pious, righteous, water-walking, never-felt-any-pain kind of person, remember this. Jesus fell to the ground in desperation, calling out, I would dare say by reading this, what looks like fear attempting to control him. He calls out to God. And what did he call out? What did he speak? What words came off of his lips as he called out to God? Verse 36 says this, Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Think of this moment in his life, even as we consider the time in which we live, the time into which he was born, the time that remains for all of us. You see, Jesus' display of unity with the Father was one where he said, it's not my feelings and my fear that I'm asking God to join me with. It's in spite of my feelings and my fear, I am saying, God, it's about your will. That's what unity looks like. That's what unity looks like. And, and, and Jesus, from that place of closeness, we read of Jesus as being one who never said anything that God didn't tell him to say. That's called intimacy with God. He never did anything that the Father didn't direct him to do. That's called intimate obedience to the Father. He, he, never, he never went anywhere, said anything, did anything that God didn't direct him into. That's how he lived a sinless life. He says, Father, in John 17, when Jesus prayed, he says, Father, even as you and I are one, may those who believe in you through my name, may they also be one. We live in days where great calls for unity ring out among all people. Unity, which means something like, be quiet and do what I say. Those are the calls of unity that we're hearing today. Unity, which means stop arguing and just agree on something. That's what unity looks like through a worldly viewpoint. That's not the kind of unity Jesus prayed for. Jesus prayed for the kind of unity that was like, he says, God, Father, as you and I are one, may they be one. What made Jesus and the Father one? I'll tell you exactly what made them one. The will of the Father guiding the way. What will make the church unified today? It's not everybody agreeing to meet at a certain time or dress a certain way or sing or not sing or say or not say or do or not do or, or believe or not believe. It, these are not the items that create unity in the church. These are the things that create uniformity and are most often perpetrated by the desire of some human being to control other human beings. But what will make the church unified today is the will of the Father being done by believers. It's not about getting somebody to think you're right. It's about lending or yielding your will to the will of the Father. No matter how painful, no matter how difficult, no matter how much loss that will incur in your life, saying, God, your will, your will. God's will brings unity. Amen. And any unity that is short of God's will is not of God's will. So keep doing and believing and living according to God's will. And we can know his will, by the way. We can know the will of God. This is what the Spirit points us to. This is what the Word transforms our minds to understand. We can know the will of God. Jesus taught us to do the will of God, to pray the will of God. This is the unity that we have as we call out Abba, Dad, Papa, he hears us. He hears us. You know, Martin Luther said in response to this idea of the Spirit crying out within us, listen to this quote. Let the, this is from Martin Luther. He says, let the law, sin, and the devil cry out against us until their outcry fills heaven and earth. The Spirit of God outcries them all. Our feeble groans, Abba, Father, 
will be heard of God sooner than the combined racket of hell, sin, and the law. I want you to know that when a child of God calls his name from a place of identity, knowing who they are, from a place of freedom, from a place of the Spirit of God, he does not turn his ear the other direction. He does not turn his face from you. Child of God, when you call out to him, his heart is towards you. His face is towards you. His attention is towards you. Some might be tempted to think, well, why is he late then? God is never late. He is calling us to put our complete trust in him, even as a small child puts their trust in their parents, even though they may fear, even though there may be some pain, even though there may be some scary things to walk through. Is God your Abba Father? Uh, I, I, I should prepare you when I ask non-rhetorical questions, and that was one of them. Let me just ask you this. Is God your Abba Father? then as you cry out to him, you can be assured that he hears you. You can be assured that he walks with you. You can be assured that you are in a great position. Because as verse seven says, now you're no longer a slave, but you're God's own child. And since you're his child, God has made you his heir. His heir. Think of this. You have an inheritance. You, me, a slave who has been purchased, been given freedom, been adopted into the family, been given the spirit of God, been given the right to call out to him as Papa, Daddy, Abba, Father, in addition to all of these blessings, has been given an eternal inheritance. And what is your inheritance? Friends, your inheritance is nothing short of God himself. God himself. He says, I belong to you and you to me. I am your eternal reward and your life everlasting. Now you belong with me and to me forever. No longer a slave. What a story that is. That's your story, or it could be your story. You know, if you've not placed your faith in this Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, if you've not heard of his great love for you by dying in your place, paying for your sin, not only dying, but being raised to life again, and declaring that anyone who puts their faith in him will have eternal life, today is the day to let your heart consider it. If God's giving you faith to believe that, would you respond to him today? All across this room, would you pray with me just for a moment with your heads bowed and eyes closed? I just wanna ask you this question again. Is God your Papa, your Abba Father? Or does he feel more distant than that? Are you right before God, or are you still carrying the chains of the law, slavery to your own sin? If that's the burden you're carrying, friends, I would invite you to let go of that burden today. If you're not right with God, and you want to be, if you've not given your life to Jesus, and you want to today, Will you just signal me? Let me see your hand, if that's you today. I just wanna know if there's somebody here that I'm praying for and with. You're saying, I, I wanna give my life to Jesus today. Just quickly, I'm scanning the room. Yes, thank you, my friend. Back over here, are there others? Say, I wanna give my life to Jesus today. What do I do? What do I do? The Bible says this, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sins and that God raised him from the dead and just confess that he's your Lord. Say, Jesus, be my Lord. If you could bring your mouth to that moment of confession, if you could receive the faith from God to believe 
that he died and rose for you. I'll just tell you right now, God's saving you right now. He is calling you his own. He is freeing you from the cage of your imprisonment to sin. He's making you a child of God. He's putting, even right now, he's putting his spirit within you. He's putting his spirit within you. If you did, to my friend who raised their hand, would you just let, let me know, let somebody know here today, there's a card in the seat in front of you. Maybe you already turned a connect card in, but go ahead and fill a second one out, put your name on there, and maybe check that box that says, today I'm choosing to become a Christian. If you're online or at home, or you'd simply like to use your phone, you can text the word Jesus now to the number 94090. We wanna walk with you in the season ahead, equipping you in this decision, this reality, this identity of who you really are. So I ask each of you to your heart, to the deepest level of your awareness, who are you? Who are you today? Are you a son or a daughter of God? And if that's true, I want you to know this. Whatever place of need that you find yourself in, call out to him. Not as a benevolent dictator, not as a distant creator, but as a close father, as a papa. All across this room, would you just join me in standing? Just with an upraised hand, how many of you find yourself at a crossroad, at a position, at a place in life where you need to call out to daddy, Abba, Papa, Father today about something? How many of you are in a place, such a place? I know I prayed with some friends at the altar at the 9 a.m. service who said, I need God because if without him, I don't know. I just want you to know, call out to him. In fact, do better than that. Let the spirit that he has placed in you, his spirit, call out from your place of need, from what's going on in your life. And you know what? Don't let that need, don't let that sickness, don't let that difficulty tell you who you are. You're a child of God. You're a son and a daughter of the Most High. He's made you, he's made you like a natural born child and he's given you, he has given you an eternal inheritance. Let me speak a blessing over you and as I do, when I say amen, if you're in an Abba Father moment, and you wanna come and cry out to God, I just wanna invite you, just when I say amen from the blessing, to come to this altar and to just pray. To my friend who just said, I wanna say yes to Jesus, would you join others who are coming here to pray? We'll have friends and pastors that'll come and be able to pray. We're so grateful that you joined us here today at Cedar Park Church. We know there's a lot of ways that you could be spending your time, but we're thankful that you are here with us. And we pray that it was a meaningful time, that you were encouraged, that you heard from the Lord. That's right, and even though we're separated by time and space, we want you to know that it's important to us that you're with us today. And we're praying for you and believing in God's best for your life. And whether you're watching online because you're traveling or out of town, or maybe you're just checking out church, we would love the opportunity to say hello to you in person soon. So may God bless you and thanks for spending your time with us today.